Thank you, Dr. Hachikosti, and thank you to the organizers for accepting my paper to be presented in the conference. Um, the 1950s was a time of political and ideological turmoil in Cyprus. On the one hand, the Greek Cypriot community, the largest community on the island, demanded a gnosis, union with Greece, a demand that in the 1950s took the form of a request for self-determination, while the British government wanted to keep the status quo and Cyprus as a colony. The Cyprus Archbishop Rick, the national and spiritual leader of the Greek Cypriot community, embarked on an enlightening campaign to raise awareness over the island's Hellenic cultural identity in support of its agenda for self-determination through the intervention of the UN. Within this context, Apostolos Berberis arrived on the island in July 1954, only a few months before the commencement of the UN General Assembly meeting during which the Cyprus problem was going to be discussed. Commissioned by the Greek government that was to represent Cyprus at the UN, the professional photographer, who also carried the title of an official photographer to the Greek royal court, spent 10 days on the island, during which he created an extensive collection of photographs framing Cypriot landscapes, monuments, archeological sites, and folkloric scenes. His instructions were clear. He had to collect visual evidence of the island's Hellenic affinities to be used by the Greek government and its ally, the Cyprus Archbishop Greek, for strengthening their argument that an island that shared cultural and spiritual bonds with Greece should not remain under colonial rule. Cyprus Byzantine and post-Byzantine monuments and Greco-Roman antiquities received prime attention, dominating Berberi's selective representation of the island's history and cultural heritage. His photographs contradicted representations that were circulating on the island at the time that were meant to serve a very different scope, that of promoting the island as an ideal tourist destination in line with the British government's tourism agenda. Berberi's aesthetic approach, evident in his representations of the island Hellenic cultural heritage in comparison to images produced locally, attests to his participation in a very different iconographic tradition. This, this paper will attempt to shed light on these opposing explorations and representations of Cypriot heritage in the 1950s and how these opposing claims over the island's monuments and archaeological sites shape their meaning and reception as material traces of the past. To this selective Hellenocentric documentation of Cyprus of the 1950s, Berberis was not the only one to contribute. This triptych of Greco-Roman antiquities, Byzantine heritage and folk culture employed for visualizing Cyprus' connection to the Hellenic world was also employed by Athenatar Suli, a well-known Greek writer, historian and artist who was commissioned by the Church of Cyprus to produce an illustrated publication dedicated to the island and the Greek Cypriot national cause. Tarsuli's monumental two-volume book was published in 1955 and 1964, respectively. The impressive color map she designed to illustrate the first pages of volume one summarized her Hellenocentric approach towards the island's history and cultural heritage. One may notice how the map is flooding with representations of the island's Byzantine and post-Byzantine monuments, its Greco-Roman archaeological sites, and scenes of traditional Greek Cypriot peasant life. On the contrary, aspects of the island's magnificent Gothic architecture are nowhere to be found. What is also striking is the complete absence of any reference to the 300 years of Ottoman occupation and its architectural remains. Not a single mosque is evident, nor any, not any, nor any representation of the Greek Cypriot community or any other community except from the Greek Cypriots. A very different perception of Cyprus and its most valued monuments and antiquities is communicated through another map included in an illustrated pamphlet published by the British government on the island in 1948. The pamphlet circulated locally in Britain and the rest of the colonies as part of the government's tourist agenda. This map seems more inclusive towards the representation of the island's cultural heritage, even though it gives particular emphasis to the island's Lusignan cathedrals, Venetian fortifications, and Crusaders' castles, 
not only visually, but also in writing, as you may see on the banner presented on the map to the left. However, the promotion of Cyprus Matilear cultural heritage as a tourist attraction by the British government was not, only, was not always the case, rather than a product of the 1930s. Until then, Governor Sir, Governor Sir Nora Roland Storr's perception of Cyprus as the garden of the Near East prevailed. He supported the dissemination of tourist material that presented Cyprus as a safer, watered-down version of the exotic East that could satisfy the expectations of Western Europeans traveling to the East and those of people from Egypt and other neighboring countries who usually took their holidays in Europe. Representations of Gothic monuments and mosques dominated postcard designs that were circulating on the island at the time. However, the Swedish Cyprus expedition's fundamental work in Cyprus between 1927 and 1931 brought to light magnificent archaeological remains, which attracted international interest that the British government couldn't have left unnoticed. Around the same time, in the interest in Byzantine art and architecture was to grow in Europe among academics and the increasing number of tourists traveling to the Eastern Mediterranean. Therefore, one may notice that the new postal stamp series published by the British government in 1934 included designs that depicted archaeological sites such as Salamis, the Palace of Buni, and the Theatre of Soli. The last two were excavated by the, Cyprus Swedish, by the Swedish Cyprus expedition. This, the series also included a view of, Byzantine, of the Byzantine church of Ayos Varnavas and Iladionas in Peristerona. The iconography of postcards and postal, design, postcal, postal stamps produced in Cyprus was about to change from there and after, with images of Byzantine monasteries and Greco-Roman antiquities being more frequently selected by postcard producers. At the same time, representations of Gothic and Ottoman monuments did not lose their prevalence in Cyprus tourist iconography. However, if one would compare the various photography of the island's Greco-Roman antiquities to the work of photographers engaged locally in the tourist business, would notice differences in their style and aesthetics. Indicative examples are located in postcard collections by the Greek Cypriot Andreas Sotiril and Dakis Muretos, working in the 1950s for the British company Tag and Sons. Sotiril photographed tourists po posing on top of one of the collapsed columns at Salamis, uh, that is the photographs you see on the top left, and below a color postcard by Muretos that depicts a family visiting Urion. On the right, a photograph by Berberis framing a view of the archaeological site of Salamis. A photograph that was selected along with many more by, Angel by Angelos Prokopiou for the illustration of the album Cyprus at Hellenic Island that was published in Athens in 1954 by the Press and Information Department of the Greek government. A publication that was directly associated with Berberis assignment on the island, sharing the same scope that was to shape perceptions over the island's Hellenic cultural heritage in support of the Greek Cypriot demand for self-determination. Berberis photographed the Corinthian style colonnade devoid of any human presence that could interrupt the viewer's appreciation of the site's architectural magnificence. The fact that this image was captured from a low angle magnified the already enormous size of the columns, standing tall and proud as the keepers of the island's Hellenic cultural identity. Prokopiu, who seems to have grasped Berberi's attention, intention for this photograph, he produced the following caption, and I quote, Greek architecture imprinted its own inaliable character upon these stones. These columns must be turned to dust and ashes before this memory can disappear, end quote. In Prokopiu's album, Salamis was reinvented to a diachronic symbol of the island's Hellenic cultural identity. However, the very bigger innovation is evident in his, in his photography that frame aspects of the island's Byzantine heritage. Either as a stage to his narrative-driven compositions or as, a car or, as, or as carriers of invented political messages, Berberis exploited the island's Byzantine and post-Byzantine monuments as the pillars of his Hellenocentric iconography of Cyprus. Sometimes he blended aspects of Byzantine heritage with representations of folk culture evident in the dancing scene he photographed at the courtyard of Panagia Glikiotis Sengerinia. 
men and women dressed in the Greek Cypriot and mainland Greek traditional costumes were photographed dancing in a circle, a scene that symbolized all those aspects that connected Cyprus to Greece culturally and spiritually. The overall staging of the scene and the embedded political messages in support of the Greek Cypriot national cause for Enosis was acknowledged by Prokopiou, who dedicated the middle pages of his album to the scene at Glykiotis. In other instances, Berberis extended his spectrum to document scenes of monastic life while visiting monasteries all around the island. Interesting enough, he used also this part of his photography to communicate messages in support of the scope of his expedition. At Giko's monastery, he photographed the inside of a monk's cell where the portrait of King John II of Greece was hanging from the wall next to an icon of the Virgin Mary. The king's portrait received a sense of holiness and a place in the monk's prayers. Interestingly enough, even in those cases that Berveri's images share thematic and aesthetic similarities with those that circulated in service of the tourist business in Cyprus in the 1950s, their use and reception shared their meaning and interpretation. For example, on the left, a photograph by Berveri's framing an icon painter at Stavrovuni, Stavrovuni Monastery that was included in Prokopius' album. On the right, a photograph by Reno Whiteson, a governmental officer, included in his album, Cyprus in Picture, published in 1953, targeting the promotion of the island as a tourist destination. While Prokopiu made sure to highlight the monks' painting techniques inspired by Byzantine traditions, Whiteson made sure to present the monastery as an attraction to potential tourists targeting their ethnographic interests. He commented that the older monks would paint what the younger ones worked out in the fields. He also invited visitors to taste the honey produced at the monastery that was the best in Cyprus. What Berberis achieved with his photography and Darsuli with her brush was to produce a Hellenocentric iconography of Cyprus, one that was selective, focused only on those aspects that connected Cyprus to Greece but also innovative in comparison to the established tourist iconography promoted locally by the British government. Berveris and Arsuli were influenced by iconographic trends that prevailed in Greece in the 1950s, shaped by the national quest for promoting Greece and Greekness as the antidote to the crisis that prevailed following the end of the Greek Civil War. Artists and photographers turned to, the, to a well-defined palette of themes followed as the recipe for visualizing Greekness, creating picturesque representations of landscapes, Byzantine monuments, classical antiquities, and idealized stage scenes of peasant life, excluding any sign of the era's pathologies. A recipe that had proven successful also by the Hellenic Tourism Organization, EOD, which was, which was eager to exploit Greekness as a commodity and a tourist attraction. The image on the left was the official poster published by EOD in 1951, and on the right, a photograph by Berberis captured in Cyprus that it is apparent they share thematic and aesthetic similarities. The photographers of the Hellenic Photographic Society, of which Berberis was a founding member, could not remain uninfluenced by the new prevailing trend. Papadimos, who joined the society in the late 1960s, embraced this, this stereotypical palette of themes, evident in his photography of Cyprus, sharing thematic similarities and, and aesthetic similarities with that of Berberis. Overall, the examination of Berberis' photography of Cyprus, situated in the political and ideological context that shapes its production in the 1950s in comparison to images that were produced locally to promote the island as a tourist destination, shed light on how different uses of the island's past, and especially its monuments and archaeological sites, shape perceptions of heritage and identity. On the one hand, these material traces of, were treated by the British government as, uh, as colonial assets, trophies gained further to the island's acquisition that were, that were to be exploited as tourist attractions. An, an observation that brings to mind Benedict Anderson's assertion on how, and I quote, colonial regimes 
uh, regimes attach themselves to antiquity. Monumental archaeology increasingly linked to tourism allowed the state to appear as the guardian of a generalized but also local tradition. The old sacred sites were to be incorporated in the, into the map of the colony and their ancient prestige. And, and, and end quote. On the other hand, the Greek Cypriots and the advocates of their national cause imagined the reinvention of the island's Byzantine monuments and Greco-Roman archaeological sites as national symbols of their Hellenic cultural heritage. Berberi's photography contributed to this reinvention through his Hellenocentric aesthetic approach nourished within artistic trends that prevailed in Greece in the 1950s. His photographies, use and reception, generated meanings and interpretations that shaped the monument's iconography and reception. In some, the very photography of Cyprus of the 1950s was examined as, an, as another case study among the many, addressing wider discussions on how select, selective representations of the, of the past contribute in asserting ideologies and shaping perceptions of cultural identity. Um, and a note on, uh, on the bibliography. Um, thank you.